This is the Boeing 737 aeroplane. It is the workhorse of British charter airlines and dozens of other airlines around the world. Today, there are more than 1,100 Boeing 737s in service. For nearly 20 years, the aircraft and its engines have enjoyed an unrivaled safety record. But on August the 22nd this year, at 12 minutes past seven in the morning, the 737's proud reputation suffered a sudden blow. The sound of an exploding engine echoed across Manchester Airport. A 737 belonging to British Air Tours, the charter subsidiary of British Airways, caught fire as it was about to take off. Within a few minutes, 54 holidaymakers had died in the inferno that cut the plane in two. 14 more were injured, one of whom died later. How could this disaster befall such an inherently safe aeroplane? A complete answer must await the examination now being carried out by the government's accidents investigation branch. But already a close examination of the last days of the holiday jet, call sign Juliet Lima, raises important questions as to how it was operated and maintained by British Airways. Until this summer, British Air Tours had a better than average safety record. In 11 years, it had blotted its copybook only twice. The first time in 1974, a damaged Boeing 707 flew back from Crete with 156 passengers without a proper inspection. Wing panels had buckled after a heavy landing there. Numerous fuel leaks were later found. One of the four bolts holding an engine to the wing had broken and the catches securing an engine cover had snapped. A report by the Accidents Investigation Branch said the engine could have dropped off and caused a fire or loss of control. It criticised both the captain for being irresponsible and the engineering staff at Gatwick for not being more realistic. The second Air Tours incident was in May this year. A TriStar overshot the runway at Leeds, finishing ignominiously on its nose. All 416 passengers and crew escaped without serious injury. After the Manchester disaster, doubts were expressed about the judgments of those responsible for the safety of Juliet Lima. These doubts have been raised by a senior executive of British Airways itself, Alistair Cumming, Director of Engineering for the entire fleet. Earlier this month, he was reported as saying, the worst thing that we can do is put our heads in the sand and say it was someone else's problem. Every single aspect of this accident will be thoroughly investigated. It has to be, obviously, because we're deeply concerned about aircraft safety. Behind the tragic scenes of that fateful day which brought the Prime Minister to Manchester lies a history of a troubled engine. Two years earlier, a crucial part of the engine that exploded had begun to show signs of deteriorating faster than usual. In September 1983, the engine which stripped down looked like this had its first inspection. It had completed 3,300 takeoffs. Particular attention was paid to this area containing nine burner cans where fuel and compressed air are mixed and burnt to provide jet thrust. Burner cans are made up of 11 cooling rings or liners like this. Engineers found two cracks adding up to seven inches. One was five and a half inches long, the other one and a half inches. Both were progressing round the liner. The airline with more experience on the Boeing 737 than any other European operator is Britannia Airways, which has flown the aircraft since 1968. Today, they have a 27-strong fleet. Like all British 737 operators, Britannia were ordered to check their engines following the Manchester disaster. But in the 17 years that Britannia has flown 737s, they say they've never found cracks anywhere near seven inches at first inspection. That would be so unusual. In, in the 17 years we've been operating this aeroplane and uh, nearly two million engine hours, we've never seen anything like that. If we saw anything of that magnitude, we'd be, we would have to be um, conducting a, a review of our inspection procedures and 
and our operating procedures. Some burner can cracking is inevitable because of the very high temperatures inside. Cracks become very dangerous if they progress 360 degrees or all the way round. When that happens, the can separates and may become misaligned. Hot gases and flame burn a hole through the surrounding casing. There is a high pressure inside that casing and that flame and the heat could weaken this case to the extent where uh, it eventually ruptures and then you have an explosive decompression and shrapnel pieces will fly in all directions. British Airways repaired the seven inches of cracks in Juliet Lima's burner can by welding them. But when the can separated nearly two years later, leading to 55 deaths, it split partly along the old weld repair. Unlike British Airways, many airlines have been replacing cracked liners with new ones instead of welding them. In December 1980, the engine manufacturers Pratt & Whitney sent a warning to British Airways and others. It said that welded liners were prone to splitting in two because they weren't as strong as new ones. Nevertheless, Pratt & Whitney do approve of welding, but for the last five years they've advised airlines who choose to weld to also use two special strengthening processes. These are known as solution heat treatment and stress relief. They're designed to help prevent burner cans breaking in half. In February 1983, seven months before Juliet Lima's burner can was repaired, Pratt & Whitney recommended stress relief for cracks over two and a half inches. The longest crack in Juliet Lima's can was five and a half inches. British Airways, however, chose not to stress relieve the repair. This was optional. Nor did they use the solution heat treatment because they had problems with the equipment. The airline's decision not to use these two strengthening processes was accepted by the Civil Aviation Authority, the government's air safety watchdog. The airline only began using solution heat treatment in March this year, after receiving a reminder by telegram from Pratt & Whitney. The cable again urged all airlines to solution heat treat for older burner cans to provide maximum reliability. In December 1980, Pratt and Whitney left British Airways in little doubt as the result of a crack going all the way round. In a letter they said, these cracks, upon reaching 360 degrees, can permit the chamber to separate and possibly cause fuel spray deflection and outer combustion chamber case burn through. The consequences of a burner can breaking up became all too evident at Manchester last August. When Juliet Lima's burner can split partly along the old weld line, it had run 4,611 hours since repair. Despite the warning from Pratt & Whitney that welded burner cans have a shorter life than new ones, British Airways inspection procedures didn't require another inspection until they'd done a further 4,000 hours. In the average life of a British Airways 737, that means an inspection wasn't mandatory until the summer of 1986, about a year after the accident. Some airlines check their burner cans very frequently if they've been repaired. Lufthansa, who have a large 737 fleet, inspect them every 600 flying hours. That's about every four months. They also line the insides of cans with a special ceramic coating to make them last longer. It's one of several improvements that British Airways have adopted since the Manchester fire. Three days before the fatal accident, Juliet Lima's repaired burner can must have been in an advanced stage of deterioration. During that time, the jet made 13 journeys to European sunspots and back. Twice the warning signs of disaster were there, Twice, they were tragically misread. The first sign of trouble came after the jet took off from the Greek island of Crete for Manchester late on Monday, August the 19th. Three hours and 40 minutes later, the jet arrived in Brussels for a refueling stop. Within an hour, it was taxiing out again for takeoff. 
unknown to the crew, the burner can by then had almost certainly cracked all the way round. But they did. quite seriously wrong with engine number one. Running up the power for takeoff, the pilots noticed that it was much slower to accelerate than engine number two. To balance the engines, they had to push the throttle up to two inches further forward than the throttle for the good engine. That's known as throttle stagger. For some 737 pilots, two inches of stagger is unacceptably high. There are some occasions when it's necessary to apply a lot of power quite rapidly on an aircraft. For example, when? In an emergency, in braking, stopping an aircraft, or in having to overshoot. And if the thrust levers can't be advanced together, or you can't rely on them giving equal thrust, um, it gives you a control problem. In the air, it will cause the engine, the aircraft to roll, and on the ground, it will cause it to um, swing considerably and reverse thrust and make the whole stopping action far less effective. You wouldn't fly with two inches of throttle stagger? With two inches, I wouldn't. Shortly before 3 a.m. on Tuesday, August the 20th, the jet arrived back in Manchester from Brussels. British Airways had been experiencing a spate of slow acceleration and throttle stagger problems in many of their 737s, Juliet Lima included. Adjustments to the fuel supply had seemed to cure the problem. This time, though, there was a difference. Juliet Lima had never suffered from so much throttle stagger before. Her technical log suggests, however, that a fuel supply problem was again thought to be the likeliest cause. A pressure pipe was checked for leaks, the fuel system bled for airlocks. Pilots were asked to keep an eye on the problem. At 10.31 on Tuesday morning, the jet departed on the 4,000 mile round trip to Rhodes. There's no mention in Juliet Lima's log that I've seen of any attempt to see whether the work done on the fuel system and the pressure pipe had helped to alleviate the problems which were being experienced by the crews. That is, the throttle stagger and the slow acceleration. All that uh, the next crew were told was to report on the next flight with passengers. Surely the prudent thing to have done would have been to carry out a ground run of the engine before the aircraft flew again with passengers, but apparently this wasn't done. Over the next 24 hours, Juliet Lima crisscrossed the skies of Europe. The holiday jet made return trips to Rhodes and Mallorca. During those 24 hours, there were no further reports of engine defects. But with every journey that passed, the metal casing surrounding the split burner can was getting weaker and weaker. Hot gases were now burning away at the casing. Left unattended, it was a time bomb waiting to explode. From now on, the lives of those travelling in the jet hung by a thread. At 2.15 on the afternoon of Wednesday, August the 21st, Juliet Lima arrived back in Manchester after a trip to Barcelona. This time, the crew gave a detailed report that the engine had deteriorated. Acceleration on engine number one was again abnormally slow. Throttle stagger was also present. Advancing the throttle to the halfway mark, the engine took up to six seconds to respond. A healthy engine should have taken half that time. On the ground, its idling speed was abnormally low. But British Airways had become conditioned to dealing with these symptoms by adjusting the fuel supply. Once again, the engineers concentrated on this as being the likeliest cause of slow acceleration and the throttle stagger. It seems from the technical log of uh, Juliet Lima that the possibility of a burner can separation or split hadn't occurred to the engineers. This is surprising. We know that Pratt & Whitney 
twice since 1980 have sent out warning letters to British Airways and to other operators, indicating quite clearly that slow acceleration is a classic sign of a possible burner can separation or split. Whether those warnings were adequate on the part of Pratt & Whitney is perhaps another question. I personally think that more could have been done by the manufacturers. But the fact remains that British Airways had had these two uh, written notices setting out the condition. The first of these warnings was sent in January 1980 after the burner can of an American jet exploded on takeoff sending shrapnel flying through the tail fin. The warning said that burner can separation could be signalled by slow acceleration. It also said that the slow acceleration had been readily apparent to the flight crew. The second warning came by telegram last February, after engine casings ruptured in two more American jets on takeoff. Reports of slow acceleration, the cable said, should be suspected as a cause of separated burner cans. I think Pratt & Whitney could have done more to bring this condition to the attention of operators, but equally, British Airways certainly received those two written warnings, and they could have done more to act upon them. It could be that neither took them perhaps as seriously as they should have done, because they followed a number of incidents, I think eight incidents in the United States, where burner cans had split or separated, and fortunately, on none of those occasions, anybody lost their lives. Since the engineers were focusing on fuel problems as the likeliest cause of slow acceleration, they adjusted the idling speed of the sick engine to try and get both engines to match. The aircraft was towed out to a remote part of the airfield to see what effect the adjustments had made. For much of that afternoon, the airport shook to the thunder of the engine being run up and down. Juliet Lima's technical log shows that the engineers did manage to match the idle speeds of the two engines. But they made a large adjustment, one that would normally be followed by a full ground test known as a trim test. The log also shows that this adjustment had not completely cured the slow acceleration. Engine number one still seemed slower than number two. The exact cause of the problem was never identified. It might have been had every stage of Pratt & Whitney's troubleshooting procedures been followed. Since 1980, British Airways and others have been urged to do so when the cause of slow acceleration wasn't readily apparent. The procedures mean that if fuel supply adjustments don't cure the problem, the engine should be removed and its burner cans inspected. Why the procedure wasn't completed isn't clear. Finally, Juliet Lima was passed as fit to fly to Athens that Wednesday night. It was agreed that the full trim test to diagnose the root cause of slow acceleration should be postponed. At two minutes past eight, the jet left for the 3,500 mile round trip to the Greek capital. On the way there, the co-pilot remarked that the troubled engine's performance had improved. He'd last flown the aeroplane 48 hours before on its return from Brussels when the slow acceleration was first reported. What he didn't know was that the adjustment made that afternoon to the fuel system had dealt with the symptoms but not the cause. Three and a half hours later, the jet touched down in Athens. It was delayed for 40 minutes because of the late arrival of a group of passengers. After two hours on the ground, it departed for home. It was the last flight the aircraft would ever make. Just before sunrise, Juliet Lima arrived back in Manchester. By now, more than 48 hours had elapsed since the first reports of slow acceleration and throttle stagger. Tragically, the alarm bells hadn't yet rung. 
They might have done had British Airways been continuously monitoring all of Juliet Lima's vital engine performance trends, like exhaust temperature. Most 737 operators do this to check engine efficiency for economy reasons, but there are important safety benefits too. Since the accident, British Airways have included all their 737s in a comprehensive monitoring program. In America, there was an example where a performance readout, such as I have here, showed a dramatic increase in the engine temperature and the fuel flow, whereas the two engine compressors deteriorated. Uh, the engine was pulled, stripped, and they did in fact find a burner can broken before it done any damage. Shortly before 7 a.m. on Thursday morning, Captain Peter Terrington took his seat in the cockpit of Juliet Lima. Soon afterwards, 131 passengers boarded the aircraft bound for Corfu. At 12 minutes past seven, the pilots ran up the engines to take off power and release the brakes. 32 seconds into the takeoff roll, there was a loud bang. The burner can had exploded out of the engine, smashing a fuel inspection panel on the wing. Gallons of fuel gushed out of an eight inch hole onto the hot engine, creating an inferno fanned by a roaring slipstream. Flames started to come out of the engine, which was to my left. Um, I was looking out of the window and saw all the smoke coming off. I stood up almost immediately and somebody to my right hand side of the aircraft said, um, stay in your seats, don't panic. So I sat down again, but I almost immediately stood up, turned round, and about three windows down, there was a crack in the window and a little hole. The smoke was coming in. I presume the crack was through the heat. The smoke was coming in, and so I said to Charlie, come on, you know, I don't like this, we're getting off this plane. Pilot reacted immaculately to the explosion. He thought it was a, a wheel, which is the, the normal sort of expect, thing he would expect to happen. And, he, and in under a second, he decided to reject the takeoff, which is a very, very quick professional reaction. To give him more braking power, Captain Terrington reversed the thrust of both engines. Unfortunately, due to damage uh, the hydraulic power supply on number one engine, the reverse bucket stayed deployed. Now, you have fuel coming out in great gobbets from this hole in the wing onto a hot engine, which then ignites. And the airflow was blowing the fuel air vapor which are then ignited onto the reverse buckets, which then focused onto the rear fuselage. We think this is the way most probably it got into the fuselage as quickly as it did. And within a few seconds of the aircraft coming to a stop, the center of the fuselage was, was covered in orange flames, and from the center backwards was just a thick pall of black smoke. Inside the aircraft? Inside the aircraft. So I was amazed how quickly it had all spread into the rear of the plane. My boyfriend came off and said, I've just taking a mouthful of this smoke and um, he said it's awful people are going to die he said but um, he took the smoke and almost immediately he felt himself reeling he said he, he wouldn't think it would take much more to actually become unconscious from it just one lungful yeah there was no instruction given that the plane was being evacuated I mean, people were obviously wanting to leave but no specific instruction was given people were trying to take hand baggage from the the luggage rack in the fuselage, which again delayed people moving down the aisles. I think clear instructions that those sort of things should be definitely left in the case of evacuation would also have saved a few seconds. And a few seconds in that situation may well have been a few lives. In the immediate aftermath of the tragedy, the most pressing problem for British Airways and others was to check their 737s for burner can cracks. On September the 6th, representatives of all seven British airlines using the Pratt & Whitney engine met to compare notes. After the meeting, it was clear that British Airways had a serious cracking problem in burner cans at their first inspection. Cracks adding up to 11 inches had progressed around one burner can, and it was found well inside the maximum time limit for its first inspection. It was close to the critical point where cracks begin to speed up until the can splits in two. British Airways had to ground 13 of its 737s, so short of aeroplanes were they, that Concorde had to be used on domestic services while extensive checks were made. 
Their jets are now back in the air with a new regime of safety procedures designed to prevent any recurrence of the Manchester disaster. If this disaster brings new lessons in the field of safety, then it will be another example of the paradox of good coming out of a great tragedy. For those who've lost their loved ones, however, two central questions remain. Why didn't British Airways use the recommended repair procedures? And why didn't they heed Pratt & Whitney's warnings that a burner can could explode? British Airways said they didn't wish to comment while the official investigation is still in progress. But tonight there was some comforting news for the survivors and relatives of the dead. Their lawyers and those of British Airways, Boeing and Pratt and & Whitney, hope soon to agree compensation for their injuries and their suffering.